Good evening, folks, and uh, welcome back to the page. It's Chris Kerwin here with Astronomy by the Bay, and I've got uh, Paul Owen here with me, and I've got Mike Powell here with me. <laughs> Where's Mike? He's still there. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just watching the live stream as it's uh, feeding out on both uh, channels right now, so we're simulcasting on both. That's great. So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday night astronomy show. Uh, first of all, uh, just happy Victoria Day, happy Victoria Day long weekend. God bless the Queen. Huh? Gives us this day off. Isn't that nice? That's all for so we got uh, both Paul, uh, Paul Owen and Mike Powell here with us tonight, both amateur astronomers like myself who just enjoy uh, sharing the hobby. So uh, welcome to part two now of our workshops on choosing the right uh, telescope. Now these workshops may run a little bit longer than an hour. Uh, we're not quite sure how this one's going to run out tonight, but uh, we hope you can stay with us as long as you can. So we have a lot of uh, material to cover here and we want some time to answer your questions as well. Okay, somebody's got their sound tone. There we go. That's better. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so last week we talked all about optical tubes and the different types of optical tubes and the good and bad on each. And uh, tonight's show, we're going to focus mostly on telescope mounts, uh, the different types of mounts and the good and bad of each type. And then, of course, next week with our part three, we're going to discuss a number of the essential accessories that you would require from eyepieces to do shields and it's not uncommon really to spend as much on accessories as you do on your own telescope, so that's kind of important. And then finally, on part four, we're going to look at what you need to bring with you to get the most enjoyment out of your evening. Uh, Paul's also going to present our Rosanna's Fun Fact segment tonight, and I have a few uh, photo submissions here to reveal as well. So sit back and enjoy, and remember, this is a live broadcast, so if you have any questions about astronomy equipment at all, this is the time to ask us. So let's get started with a little bit of a review from last week. And I'm just going to close my studio room door here. <laughs> <laughs> That'll keep the cats out. <clears throat> there we go. And uh, we're saying good evening to uh, Sean and things to see with the telescope. That must be John, Irene, and Michelle. Good evening, everybody. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk just a little bit, first of all, about, uh, about uh, telescopes. Um, the types of telescopes that we talked about last week. Uh, good evening to Louis MCA, Sighorn, and Peter. Hey, good evening from cloudy Toronto. <laughs> Toronto. Toronto. <The> big T.O. <laughs> Been there, done that. The big T.O., and I don't mean churro. Yeah. Gentlemen. Yeah. Oh, he's back. I'm back. Just a second. I'm going to hang on just for one second. You guys talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> well, we were. <laughs> he's disturbed us. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a pretty popular chip, that 294. It does a few different companies that put it in their, in their camera bodies. Um, and, um, and, and for good reason. It's such a good chip for a yeah. one shot color. It's, it's, it's Oh, hey, <laughs> yeah. So I, I found my son. Hey, like, my, my, I think hey, my, I think my son was gaming on the network. So. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So we, we were just talking just uh, uh, about Mike's camera, uh, Chris. Yes. So Mike was just uh, just filling us in on the camera a little bit. Okay. Yeah, it's just one of those times to step up with the big boys and get a, a dedicated Astro Cam as opposed to using a DSLR. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's going to make a big difference. You'll uh, you'll notice it right away. Like uh, the biggest thing you're going to notice is in the noise, because of the fact that your camera is going to have cooling with it, cooling with it built in, yeah. Yeah. a real uh, uh, tech cooling system. So uh, you'll be able to get your camera right down to wherever you want it. And the nice thing about it is, you can get it down there no matter what your outside temperature is. So if you want to go minus 15, the ambient it doesn't make any difference. The camera just recognizes it as minus 15. And it'll stay nice, icy, cold. And um, so if you want to shoot dark frames, eventually you'll get into doing that. If you want to shoot those, they have to be the same temperature as your lights. But you won't have to wait. Or sorry, you won't have to do it at the same time that you have to do with a DSLR. Because right. you can cool the camera right exactly down to where it was 
the night before the next day if you want to and go ahead and do them then, right? Yeah, so you can keep your – basically you go back to those set parameters anytime you like. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> yeah, exactly. So that in itself is uh, – it's worth its weight in gold. But the camera itself is very good. It's efficient. It's really flexible. And as you know, it's a great uh, planetary camera so that when we're doing our live streams – uh, or uh, live stacking, uh, it works fantastic for that. Yeah, I've already got the basically the dedicated planetary camera, which is the ASI two two four, and that's basically what it is. It's a it makes a good guide camera, but it was built to be a planetary camera because it's yeah. a small chip and everything is magnified so much. Yeah. So is that one? Is that a color or a mono? No, it's color. Color, yeah, yeah. It's a two two. Was it uh, 224 Pro MC or something, the same oh, as a, yeah, a 924? Yeah, oh, great. Great. Well, that's good. I'm excited for you, Mike. I can't wait to see you using that camera. You're going to just be like you died in Monday heaven. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's a, like I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a big step. It's a big purchase, especially for somebody like me that tries to go to the dollar store and make it work, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and we're I, not done with our store trips yet, so. Yeah. <laughs> and I get two really cheap cameras coming in the mail very shortly, hopefully, uh, that we're going to use for social distancing at the eyepiece. So uh, Mike and I were working on that uh, together. Um, I just, I'm just i looking right now at my uh, $30 television. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was a good deal, too. Good deal. Beats and bites, yeah. So picked up a $30 <laughs> television. That's uh, an RCA TV. No remote. I said, no problem. I don't need a remote. But yeah. uh, it, it accepts uh, Nest Video in, so um, we're going to use uh, just the uh, the video cameras set inside the eyepiece, like a Mead electronic eyepiece, and then a 10 or 15 foot cable over to the television. And um, hopefully we'll be able to offer like views of the moon and Jupiter and Saturn throughout the summer. Um, we'll look at deep sky stuff later on, but at least we'll be able to get out and do some outreach, uh, which is what we're really looking forward to the most. I yeah. guess. That'll give me another reason to go to the dollar store. I have to go pick up a bunch of those orange cones. Yeah. <laughs> and some tape. Police, and police, some tape, yeah. police line tape. Yeah. And get some of that paint that you can squirt on the ground. Yeah, that'd be good too, <laughs> wouldn't it? I was just thinking one of those uh, tennis racket bug zappers. Somebody gets too close, you give them a little whack. <laughs> Physical distancing at its best. My yeah. cat learned pretty quick. I'm sure a human might pick up in a two or three hit. <laughs> Can you imagine the three stooges trying to do that? <laughs> <laughs> wait now, there, wait now. There's three of us on this call. What's going on? <laughs> what are you trying to say, Paul? <laughs> Big hands talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back back to the show. Yes. Yeah, so I, I kicked my son off the network downstairs because he was sitting there gaming. I think that's what happened with my connection. So <laughs> Mike's used to that. Um, so oh, we're yeah. going to just talk a little bit about reflectors for a second. I'm going to go back here behind me and grab this little tabletop model. So we did talk about uh, reflectors quickly last week. And uh, again, just the idea of the reflector is the fact that it's got a large primary mirror down there in the bottom. I guess you can see it there. Yeah, I can yep. see it. Okay. Hang on. We'll I see myself. On. Yeah, let's click on uh, this one. Oh, did you second. hold that back up again? I need to yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll do this and I'll do this, and then you guys can't talk. <clears throat> Here. Uh oh, okay. So, yeah, the big mirror down there at the bottom, and that's your primary mirror that's concave in kind of shape. And then there's a small secondary mirror right up here at the front that's pointed at a 90 degree angle that points the view out here to the eyepiece. So, all the light goes down the bottom. Uh, hits that primary mirror, gets refocused back up to into a, a point of light that hits the small mirror and then comes out here to our eyeball. So our view is, because it's a concave mirror, it's upside down, uh, which doesn't really matter if you're in space. Again, what's upside down in space, we really don't know. But what it does is it provides you the largest aperture, largest piece of uh, glass or mirror surface for the least amount of money. So that's the advantage of a reflector. Also, the reflectors have, like on the back of this one, these three knobs that are adjustment knobs, three of them are lock, they lock the mirror in place, but the other three are adjustment knobs, and that's because we sometimes have to collimate the mirror. In the front, this little one here has little three little tiny screws. So we've got to make sure that the back mirror and the front mirror are looking at each other properly, or the uh, image that we're trying to pick up is going to be out of focus. Uh, OK, 
cap on whenever you're not using it. Nice little dust cap, but that's a quick uh, rundown on a reflector telescope. So, Paul, can you give us a little bit of uh, review on a refractor telescope? Okay. For a moment or two. <clears throat> Get, uh, Here comes on that 80. Here comes that 80 again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm really starting to like the telescope a lot. So um, I'm just going to put my screen on so I can see me. There we are. So basically what I talked about uh, real briefly was uh, refractors. And what refractors are are um, the most basic form of telescope. They were the, certainly the, the first form of telescope that was ever made. A really, really simple design. Light goes through the lens. Lens goes down through the tube. It focuses at a certain point. That's when you use your focuser to move your eyepiece. There we go. Back and forth so it finds that perfect focal point. Once it got it, you look down there. Uh, most refractors, <clears throat> you don't need to collimate, so they're always ready to go. And most refractors are relatively small, so uh, the cool down time on a refractor is uh, usually, you know, within a half an hour, 45 minutes at most, if you've got like a 150 millimeter, you know, a refractor, something really big and three pieces of glass, uh, a little bit longer to cool down. But other than that, they're simple to use, they're lightweight. Uh, you can put them on a tripod, just like I did this, just a camera tripod. And if you wanna uh, have a nice grab and go and get out there a refractor, that's the guy to go with. Perfect, thank you. Okay. All right, and uh, let's flip over to Mike here. Uh, Paul, you want to do my part? He <laughs> 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 yeah, that so well. <laughs> so basically, uh, what I talked about last week was uh, compound telescopes, which is uh, uh, a little bit of both. It's got a corrector plate in the front, like a lens, and it's got mirrors like a reflector. Uh, you know, there's this Indian spit cast of grain right here behind me. Uh, at some point, they say every astronomer will eventually own a Smith cast at one point in their uh, career. Uh, and there's a good reason for it. Uh, it. You don't have to collimate it as much as a road normal reflector telescope where you have to collimate back mirror and the front mirror together. This one, you only have to collimate the front mirror. And if you put a set of bobs knobs on them, you can collimate it in a matter of seconds and it gives you good views. You can still get large aperture, but what it does is being a compound scope with a lens and a mirror, is they've shortened the length. You'd normally, you know, uh, an eight inch F10 to be about four feet long. And because it folds the light, comes in the front, bounces off a primary mirror at the back, up off a secondary mirror at the front again, and then back to the eyepiece, you've shortened that optical tube up to probably at least half. So the good part about that, it makes it portable. It's easy to pack and uh, fairly light. Uh, again, collimation is relatively easy. You only have to collimate the one mirror instead of two. And, uh, you know, they say that the, the spent cast grain telescope is not great at anything, but it is good at everything. It's good at deep space. It's good at planetary. And uh, all around, you still get a fairly large aperture for a lower price than you would if you, say, bought an 8-inch refractor uh, because of the, what the glass costs to polish, it would cost you a fortune. So mm. you can still get a large aperture, uh, still get a good mirror, and still get good views for a fairly good price. So that's compound scopes. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so we've covered optical tubes now. Uh, so the next part that we wanted to talk about uh, tonight is about mounts. So uh, when we get through all of this show, when it's all done here, when we've done the four parts, uh, on, our, on our last week, we're going to do a little bit of a wrap-up on what we've covered over the, the previous three weeks. But we wanted, we're trying to give you enough information so that you can go out and make a sound decision on your own. Uh, when they start talking about optical tubes, what do you want, a reflector, refractor, or SET tube? Then you'll get an idea of what of what they're discussing. Now, next we want to talk about is mounts. And mounts really are most important because your telescope is not going to perform properly, your optical tube, unless you're sitting on the right mount. Um, so we can have mounts that are, uh, let me see if I can flip this over here. I've got a little uh, bushnell here. Maybe I'll bring that up, guys. I'm going to flip my camera here. Hey, there I am. There you are. Oh, I'm going to show off my uh, Bob Ross uh, shirt here. Painting the Milky Way. Yeah. <laughs> we put a little uh, nebula right over here. <laughs> anyway, so here's a nice uh, EQ1. I mean, this is probably a pretty popular uh, design. Let me uh, move my chair out of the way. i got limited space here, but I'm going to try to 
get an idea. So this is what a lot of us we may have uh, assumed we were going to get when we purchased a telescope. And it provides you with uh, both axes. Um, it has to be polar aligned. And they're not a bad idea, like an EQ1 isn't a bad idea, it's better than no telescope for sure. But the problem with them is that they're, they become they can become difficult to, to get to learn. And for a beginner, they are difficult. Um, so I like an Alt-As uh, telescope. This one can be used in Alt-As mode if you wanted to flip, uh, flip a couple of pieces here. And you can actually use it like this around. So horizontally and then vertically this way. But it's kind of awkward to do it that way as well. Um, But the worst part about this mount is not just the fact that it's it's fairly loose in, in in gears on the EQ1, but it also has a lot of movement. So if I was outside with this telescope and sits on an aluminum tripod, and I happen to have any kind of a breeze at all, um, the telescope is going to do this. Maybe you can't see it, but it's going to shake a lot. Yeah. So there are tricks that you can do. Uh, you can actually take the, the center piece here. The support and you can uh, tie a shopping bag off the edge of that put some rocks in it and that will, will uh, lower the center of gravity of the uh, of the tripod so it'll it'll uh, hold better and that's one way of course but uh, you can still run into a, a, a lot of problems even uh, when you're not using uh, legs that are this I'll say this beefy <laughs> because this is fairly beefy uh, but uh, they're only like inch and a quarter legs, so they're they're going to give you a lot of problems when you're trying to spend some time looking at an object because the telescope is going to move around a lot, and it's going to be difficult to control. You do have these two knobs that will allow you to to run the scope in both axes, but uh, they are still a very difficult uh, mount to get used to, and I I would suggest that there's probably hundreds of these style of, of telescopes sitting in closets all across North America right now. Because people uh, couldn't, before the days of YouTube, uh, they couldn't get these uh, these working properly. Um, guys, any comments? I have found finally the perfect use for an EQ1 mount. Okay. Uh, I've taken it and I've done all the things. I put sand in the legs to beef it up. I've taken it apart. I've added te Teflon sheets for bearings. Uh, you know, put everything in, tighten it all up so it's nice and snug, and. The only thing that I found it was good for is I bought a single motor for the uh, right ascension, uh, a little battery operated motor, and it holds a DSLR camera perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you want a low end tracking mount for your DSLR camera, uh, for 40 bucks you can buy the tracking motor and an EQ1 mount actually makes a good little tracking mount for a DSLR camera if you're doing wide field photography. I suppose for a small solar scope or something like that too would work, like maybe a small yeah. refractor. But uh, Any, anything up to a, like a small eighty millimeter short tube, yeah, uh, they're not too awful bad. And this is a you fairly start getting longer tubes, and you're they're way too small. Yeah, this is a fairly large tube yeah. for this uh, small mount, right? So, Paul, any comments? Um, no, really, it's just uh, the biggest thing about that, of course, is is if the wind comes up. The big tube will, because the telescope was so big for that mount, it just acts like a sail. Yeah. And yeah. the wind just catches it. And it's just, you know, so if there's any wind at all, they're very unforgiving. Right. Yeah. The other disadvantage to the EQ1 mount is they don't have a polar scope. So you're basically right. doing your polar alignment through the eyepiece. Right. Uh, you know, it, it works, but the setting circles are so inaccurate on them that even the setting circles, if you're trying to find RA and DEC, on a star chart and then swing an EQ1 around to the RA and DEC, you're going to be quite a ways off. Yeah. Yep. That's a disadvantage. Yeah. So basically it's really just a, it's a, it's a, a, a pellet or a, a mount to get somebody started um, with an inexpensive system is really what it's designed for. Yeah. Yeah. I found unfortunately though, with a, they get more frustrated, they get a good, a fairly good optical tube. But the mount's just not there for it. Yeah. If you don't have any experience, I guess that would be the yeah. worst. Hmm. If you're experienced, you can kind of make things work as you're 
you know, because you know what to expect. Yeah, right. that, that experience, yeah, it can be a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare. I mean, that's what we would see as a department store style telescope. We don't really see too many alt as uh, style telescopes in department stores. Um, I'm not going to name any in particular, but when you're yeah. when you're out looking for a Christmas gift for for your 10 year old or 12 year old, and you you really want to get them a nice telescope, and you invest in something like this, it's not going to be long before it's not used at all. Right. I think yeah. know, that's 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 the bottom line with them. I mean, you know, the optics aren't too bad. Uh, I've looked through this one as far as looking at the moon and planets with it. It's not bad. Uh, but uh, as far as using an EQ1 mount and getting used to it, like now you've got YouTube and things like that, I know, that you can go back and take a look at, spend some time on. But you're going to spend a lot more time learning the telescope than you are looking at the stars. Now, so, there's that, yeah. that my, my famous saying, your mount can never be too big. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the problem with the poor quality mount. Um, and again, you, you know, if you don't have a telescope, if you have this is your telescope, great. You can still use it to look at the stars with it and and the moon yep. and planets for sure. Uh, but we're trying to lead you down the path of maybe down the road you want to upgrade, or uh, you're making your first purchase, and and uh, maybe I would try to probably steer away from the EQ1 style mounts. Yeah. Well, that's, that leads up to a, a, a point that if a lot of people who are starting out, an equatorial mount may not be the way to go anyway. Mm. You know, you, you may want to start with an alt ASI mm. because you're going to use alt ASI if you're going Dobsonian, because that's what that is, just up, down, side and side to side. And you can buy some decent um, alt ASI mounts that um, you get with, and I'll let Mike lead from this, but uh, with, let's say, the SE systems, the SE mounts from Celestron. And um, those are a fork, single fork arm all dazzy. And I'll, I'll let Mike talk from there. Okay, so first of all, could somebody talk a little bit about the Bird Jones style reflectors? Because Emil did bring that up. Um, the Bird Jones style reflectors tubes. I'm not following what you mean. I'm not up on that one either. Oh, okay. <laughs> they, they use, a, you know, I'm not really up on them either, but I know it's a different design um, for a reflector. They uh, use a corrector in there. And, okay. Uh, yeah, they use a corrector to uh, maybe oh, Emil, maybe Emil can give us an explanation here while he's watching. Oh, okay. So if there's a corrector in there, it would be to correct coma. Yeah. Because if you're if you're actually imaging with a Newtonian or a Dobsonian type of a telescope, um, and your camera um, uh, sensor is flat. And with the Newtonian uh, or, or the mirror designs, they're designed when you're looking through an eyepiece, typically through a curved piece of glass. So um, what those correctors do is, is, is those, and what I mean by coma is in the corners of, of, the, of the images, there's going to be these almost like, they look like little arrows. And so instead of the stars being round right out to the edge, if you look through a uh, try to image through a reflector, all of your stars all around the edge of the circle are going to be little arrows. Okay. So you have to have what we call a coma corrector to fix that. So what he may be talking about, and again, I'm just assuming this, but what he may be talking about is that corrector, instead of buying a separate coma corrector, having it built right into your telescope so you can use it both for imaging and for uh, observing. So I know I think what he was, you know, so Emil did comment back. He said it's a type that has the correcting lens stuck inside the focus or drop tube. Right. Uh, not not a coma corrector, but uh, a type that has a correcting lens inside right. it, and it's to correct the cheaper spherical mirrors. Perhaps okay. something we can research for yeah. a future episode. Oh, yeah, oh. That's, yeah, okay. I, I thought it was a Barlow they put in there, like the Celestron C130 has what I thought was a Barlow because it does have a longer focal length, but it's still in the short shorter tube. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I'm thinking the same thing he is. Is that's, that what that's that, that's uh, what it is? That's the Bird Jones reflector style. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Emil. Yeah, I, thanks, Emil. Uh, I, I didn't. I'm not that familiar with those. So, um, so uh, Luis MCA is mentioning. So, with a better mount, the Bushnell and its cousins would work reasonably well. Um, yes, I guess so. Um, the, the mount is really the idea here uh, for stability, right? So, yeah. I mean, I've got. I mean, my 12-inch dog back here is a reflector-style telescope, and it's sitting on a nice mount. So that's what allows it to perform properly. Um, so yes, uh, Lewis, I guess if you had a better mount, uh, a Bushnell, which is, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, in, it's intro level uh, reflector for sure. 
a lot of plastic parts on it. That's the only thing about them. Um, and they can be adjusted. I mean, you can you can collimate the mirrors, okay? But uh, yes, you could you could install you could take a reflector and put it on a, a different style mount or or heavier mount actually. Okay, so let's uh, so if we were going to talk about alt as Paul did mention alt as uh, versus equatorial. So maybe I'll just take a second. We're going to probably each talk about what we like, I guess, right? So yeah. me, <laughs> me, it's Dobsonian. So uh, Dobsonian mount is, uh, let me get this one back here. You can still see me. Move my chair again. Pull this table over. And we're not going to look at this little guy over here. So that's not the same. But this guy is a Dobsonian mount. Let me click on myself here for YouTube. So uh, the stream that goes out to YouTube doesn't flip automatically, but the one to Facebook does. So there, highlight myself. Okay. And I guess we can see it in both screens. Okay, so we're looking at what's called a Dobsonian uh, mount. Now this is a reflector tube on a Dobsonian mount. And Dobsonian telescopes uh, or Dobsonian mounts were designed by a gentleman by the name of John Dobson. And John Dobson was a, um, a gentleman that moved from China with his family, and he was a monk. And uh, when he moved to San Francisco, uh, he joined the monastery there with his family. Uh, well, he was willing to come over with his family. Uh, and then he had a, a, an idea of making a telescopes that were very reasonably cheap. So he had a friend of his that uh, worked at the shipyard, and he got him to take a few portholes out of a ship that was being scrapped, and he ground them down and made mirrors out of them, and uh, he made his first telescope for six bucks. <laughs> what he wanted to do was come up with a design that was very simple, and uh, he's, he came out with this design here. So this is, this is one style. It only has one cradle, I'll call it, on one side. Um, but John's idea was to make a telescope simple so that more people would, would get to use it. John was a very, uh, very big on outreach, uh, world famous really. And uh, the, most of the designs of this style uh, were named after him. And uh, once he designed it, uh, he didn't copyright it. He wanted everybody to have the idea for themselves. So uh, many people put plans up on the internet. You can get them everywhere now on how to make your own Dobsonian uh, mount. And uh, of course, a lot, lot, lot of the uh, major companies like this one, Orion, <clears throat> and this one for Mead, and uh, they, they've all uh, copied his design and made a fortune off him. But he didn't, uh, he didn't take a, a cent for any of it himself. But he was just trying to introduce the fact of, of getting these out into the, into the field so that people could find uh, the hobby simpler. Uh, when you compare it against an EQ mount, a Dobsonian mount is very simple. It's basically a grab and go. So on this style here, this is a tabletop uh, model. This one runs around 300 bucks, 350 bucks, I guess. It's a four and a half inch Orion uh, telescope. And it's a tabletop model because you can just pick it up like that and set it right on a table or a picnic bench or whatever you want. But the idea of it is that it is a Dobsonian style mount. So Dobsonian means that it can swivel up and down this way and it can rotate back and forth this way on kind of like a lazy Susan. So if I wanted to try to find a target in the night sky, uh, once I've got my viewfinder turned on and pointed at a target and I've aligned it with the eyepiece, then it's just a simple matter of moving it around and finding any target in the sky. Very simple design. Uh, the thing about this design is that, of course, it doesn't rotate or it doesn't track with the Earth. So you have to keep bumping it just a little bit at a time. Uh, say if the moon's in your eyepiece. If the moon's really zoomed in really, really heavily, you're going to move it a little bit more often. But if you're just looking at a wide field, it's going to be moved less. But it's very simple uh, to use, and you don't really need anything more than to know where things are in the sky. Um, and this takes you away from learning the telescope into learning the night sky. You can spend a lot of time learning about different styles of telescopes and different designs, and you can spend a lot of time with, uh, with uh, computerized mounts, but this one is completely manual, of course, and it is a, what we call, this one here is called a grab-and-go, 
which is simply for that reason, because it can be just be picked up. If I wanted to go out tonight and I had the moon up, and I didn't want to take the time to set up anything larger, or to set up my battery pack, or to align my telescope, or whatever, I could just grab this one quickly, go outside and take a few quick looks at the moon. Uh, the, the reflector tube gives a nice uh, a feel for it, but uh, the, the actual design itself of the Dobsonian, again, is very simple. Horizontal axis, vertical axis, and uh, alt as design. So that's that's my favorite, and uh, a bigger version of that would be right here, which is my uh, ten inch, my twelve inch Dobsonian telescope. So you can get them anywhere from. I mean, this is just the reflector itself, the tube itself, the OTA, but the base is the same. I don't know if I can bring my camera over to show that or not. Just a sec. I'll try this. No, it might be hooked on something. Oh, of course it is. Let's try it this way. <laughs> oh, that way. Yep. There it is. Oh. There it is. So there's the base on this one. So it sits inside a cradle on either side. There and there. And again, it swivels uh, back and forth this way. Let's get back out here a little bit. It swivels back and forth like this. I can thank Mike there for the uh, for the nice design. <laughs> and uh, rotates in its cradle like this. So we're getting the same idea. It's all as so we can find any target again in the sky just by either rotating the telescope or moving it up and down in its cradle. Pretty simple. Most of the largest telescopes in the world are reflector design, but uh, most of the simpler telescopes in the world are actually uh, Dobsonian design. And the idea is that you can get out quickly once you align your finder scope and your eyepiece to the same target, you're pretty well done. Like from then on, it's quite easy to, to uh, maneuver it around and find objects in the sky that you're looking for. So it forces you really as well to learn the night sky. A manual telescope will do that. It forces you to learn where things are. Okay, you know, we can all find the moon. I think we can all find the moon, but also when we look at our morning sky right now, we've got Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars up. So if you were to go to their morning sky or even our summertime sky coming up, you'll pick out a couple of planets and the moon. Well, there's a good start. Then you just start taking chunks of the sky, like the constellation Cygnus or the constellation of Orion, and you start looking at those and trying to find what's inside those, uh, those targets. So if I have a map of New Brunswick and I want to find St. John, once I have the map of New Brunswick, I can find St. John easy enough. And that's all you're doing is breaking the sky down into 88 pieces and scanning around those pieces to try to find things that that, uh, that look good. But you're spending a lot more time now looking at the sky than you are actually working on the mount and worried about the mount. So I guess that's why I like Dobsonians the best. For me, it, I find simple is best. Um, I choose to spend more money on accessories or other, other things and more time at outreach, I guess, because of that simple fact. And uh, a Dobsonian telescope is easy to, uh, to introduce somebody to, so it's a great beginner's telescope. Um, so I guess that's what I would say about Dobsonians. Don't know if I missed, if I've left anything out, guys. You guys are, please comment if you like. Oh, but I, guess, I, can, uh, I guess we lost uh, Paul there for a second. <laughs> that's uh, we get talking about uh, a Dob is basically an alt as mount, and we were talking about that little EQ1 with the Bushnell on it. I just so happened to grab this one. This is an Altas mount as well. Let me see if you can see it. Yeah, this is an Altas mount as well. But it's a little bit beefier than that EQ1 mount. So if you were going to, you know, take uh, that optical tube, you have the Bushnell or a short tube uh, refra uh, refractor like this, this type of Altas mount is a good little way to go. It has clutches so that you can spin it and lock it. And it has a clutch on the uh, uh, alt side. So you, again, you can move it up and down and you can lock it. 
and it has both slow motion controls on the alt and the s so you can fine tune your way in on top of a of, on an object but see it sits on a, a little bit beefier tripod and it's a little bit beefier mount holding it it's got a little more weight to it and that would hold uh that longer bushnell tube a little bit better than that eq1 mount is doing it's a, it's still a good you know uh, mount to go with it's relatively solid it's probably you know the best bang for the buck I've seen for an Altaz mount on the market. If you're looking for, you know, a simple Altaz, there are some very expensive ones out there. Like anything else, you can buy a Rolls Royce or you can buy a Volkswagen. Mm. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, one uh, a simple Altaz like this one is a great little grab and go. It's small, it's steady. The wind doesn't shake this thing with a short tube ref uh, refractor on it. And I'm sure with that uh, Bushnell reflector on it, this mount would probably be a lot more steady than it is on that EQ1 mount. So, you know, there, there are some really good uh, small alt as mounts up there that you can get to put your optical tube on. You know, you only, buy it separate. The only thing we really have to do, Mike, I guess, is, is with this, uh, re this reflector is change the uh, dovetail on the bottom, right? To have it yeah, you can put a Vex and dovetail on it. And, uh, you know, it, it's real easy. They just spin off, and there you go. You're, you're disconnected. You hmm. buy one of these Vex and dovetails, and that's... Uh, basically what the mount is made to take and uh, they just slide in and you know locks up pretty good now the other good part about this one you think okay that optical tube is too long if i go to point straight up guess what i'm gonna hit the bottom of the mount well this particular one comes with its own allen key and the bolts down here at the bottom you can loosen them off and tip this whole piece back at a 45. so when it's at a 45 degree angle it's more to tilt like this your scope is pointed straight up and you're not hitting the mount Right. So that's, the, that's the Twilight mount? This is a, yeah, this one, no, uh, yeah, the Twilight 2. 22, yeah, okay. You know, the great little mount. Like it's more scientific, yep. It's, it's probably, for the price, it's probably the best one I've seen out there because it's beefy, it's quality, you know, it can take the wind, it can pretty much uh, put up to, uh, you know, almost up to an 8-inch on it. It handles my 6 really nice. I wouldn't doubt that you could put an 8-inch Smith Cassegrain on that, but you wouldn't want to go out no, on a breezy night, that's all. <laughs> but that, that, you know, when you're looking at all the mounts, uh, that's a nice little setup uh, to go with. Or if you want to get away from that EQ1 mount, uh, the price of these is under 300 and, mm -hmm. you know, shipped to your door, and you get a good solid mount that you're going to enjoy rather than get frustrated. And, so. you know, 300 bucks might sound like a lot to people. Uh, I understand that. You know, when we're looking at something like this little tabletop uh, dog back here, I said, you know, somewhere around 350, 400 bucks. You know, and that is an investment, but you have to consider it as an investment because that little telescope or that one that Mike's looking at right there now, that's a lifetime telescope. You never have to replace it. it it's not It's not something that has to be upgraded because it's manual design. There's really nothing. There's no software. There's nothing that you have to, to change on it. So you can use that little scope and pass it down uh, to your children or grandchildren if you like, and it can be a scope for forever. Like it's not something. And the good thing about telescopes is too, it's not like buying a, a snowmobile or a you know ATV or bike or whatever. The thing about telescopes is that they usually just sit in one spot, right? They, they don't move. They're you know, you take them outside, you set them up on on the on the soil, and uh, you know you're uh, you're using it. And then when you're done for the evening, you uh, you take it back and throw it back in your car again, and and uh, that's that's it. That's all it takes. So they sit in one spot, so they don't get damaged much, right? It's not like something that gets used a lot. You don't see a lot of wear and tear on them. The most wear wear and tear that you get on a telescope really is is just uh, from transporting it back and forth, right? Mostly. So, uh, so yeah, 300 bucks may sound like a big investment, but it really isn't uh, if you consider the fact that you're going to use it for a lot of observing. And uh, there, I see a comment here with Emil. So Emil mentions as well, manual telescopes can help to prolong the enjoyment of the hobby. Just finding the objects is part of the challenge. It's like a treasure hunt, and finding the object is your reward. That's true. Absolutely, that's yeah. What, that's yeah. the way we look at it. And, and you can really learn the night sky with a manual telescope. After the first uh, telescope I got, I got my uh, first real one I got from Mike, and it was um, uh, a little 150-millimeter uh, reflector on, uh, matter of fact, the mount I have is still sitting right here. <laughs> You're right, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the very first one that I got. But that's, I got a beefy, that's a beefy mount. 
It's a beefy melt, but it's uh, like Emil was saying, it is 100% uh, manual. So the very first thing I found in that was my very first galaxy, which was Andromeda. And I was sitting there and it took me a long time to find it because I did, you know, I was just a novice. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew roughly where to look in the sky. So when I finally found that thing, I got to tell you, it was just like somebody else seen Jupiter or Saturn for the first time. For oh, me, yeah. for me, it was, uh, it was M31. And it was just that little blob in the sky. I, I didn't even know what I was looking at. I just knew I found a galaxy. And then I said, okay, now where is it in the sky? I looked up. And sure enough, I could actually point it because it's a naked sky, a naked eye uh, 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 target. And uh, and yeah, so so uh, Emil is right on the money. Uh, when you're out there and you're observing and you're just getting into it and you start finding targets, it's just like finding your favorite Christmas present under the tree. <laughs> <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> over and over. Again. Yeah, I, I mean, back here, I ran into the house and I started telling Mrs. about it. Of course, you know. She, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm watching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. they all do that. <laughs> yeah, but no, there's nothing more rewarding than than to have a manual telescope underneath a night sky and to find an object that you thought you might not be able to find. You know, all of a sudden, you see Saturn, you see the rings of Saturn, and you, wow, you know, that's what that dot was over there. So now you're going to show your friends, you know, I found that dot over there. <laughs> that was Saturn. <laughs> you know, and you're going to pat yourself on the back, and you deserve to be patted on the back because, you know, learning the night sky is, it can be difficult to find some of the DSOs that we're looking for. But in most cases, if we're just looking at the moon and the planets, it's a great place to start. And then from there, you're going to hear about, oh, well, the Orion Nebula, or what's that all about? Or, you know, uh, maybe something in, uh, quote, Cygnus. <laughs> you might find something in Cygnus, eh, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing up there. No. But then, uh, my, the first time I saw a globular cluster through a small scope, it was amazing. You know, and uh, the Ring Nebula and things like that. Then all of a sudden, you start to remember where they are. So you can kind of go out underneath the night sky and you can picture maybe, maybe it you know, a dozen or so constellations, and you're thinking about what's inside those constellations. Same way as we look at the moon. We've always looked at the moon one particular way, but then when we see it through a telescope, you never look at the moon quite the same again, right? So, yeah. Well, those odd cheaters at the star party, though, when you hit the laser on a go to scope at an object and everybody's dub spins around and points towards where the laser went. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, speaking of go to scopes, uh, so maybe we'll get back into a different kind of mount. Right. So covered right now, we've covered the Dobsonian, uh, which is basically an alt azzy. We yeah. covered the little one that Mike has over there, which is uh, um, a good alt azzy for a small scope that needs to be mounted. And then there's, of course, is the German equatorial mounts. And there's um, those are certainly more complicated to use than, um, you know, than an alt azzy mount, uh, only in the, loop, the fact that you have to know how to track the night sky you got to do some polar aligning with it and stuff like that. So there are a few things you need to do with the German equatorial mount. But when you're choosing your mount, you need to decide, what am I going to do with this mount? Am I just going to do observing? If that's the case, you can buy, you know, if you want to go to a really high-end um, go-to telescope, you can go to a CPC if you want to. Something very nice, just like driving a Cadillac, and it's going to find every target you want in the sky. It's going to track them just beautifully. If all you want to do is observe or even just take images of planets, you can do that too. But if you want to, um, to do some imaging with your um, telescope, well, then you're going to need to mount this contract the sky the way that uh, the, the way that the sky moves. Well, actually, the Earth moves, but the way that the, the things are moving in the sky, you have to be able to do that. And the only way to do that is with the German equatorial mount. And I'm going to show you just um, I'm going to show you the one I've got here. I actually got a plugged in, so it's actually a go to as well. So this one here is probably one of the more problem. As a matter of fact, Mike's got one right behind him. Um, <laughs> They're popular. <laughs> and I was just going to say it's the, the one. It's one of the more popular. Okay, I got to get my camera pointed right here. Just, I can never get this camera to do what I want it to do. Try it's an one. earthquake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you can. I'm probably a little higher than I. Oh come on, really? Every other week, this works like a charm, but not this week. Okay, you know what? I'm going to bring it with me. <laughs> Come on, yeah, please. There we go. Okay, so um, 
I'm going to just kind of walk you around. I'm going to put my screen bigger so I can see what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'll be just getting everybody dizzy. Okay, so basically what this is, this is a German equatorial mount. And the whole idea behind this is um, it's designed to track the night sky. So when you look at, I don't know how far I can go with my camera. There we go. So when you look down here, you can see that there is an alt as kind of a base on the bottom. So this is where, um, there we go. So you can see this part of the scope here will actually, you can actually turn it up and down like an alt as mount. And then down here on the bottom, this will actually rotate this way as well. So, so with the German equatorial mount, you actually have what's almost like two alt as mounts built one on top of another. Because on top of that, I'm just gonna turn this back over and show you. There we go. So on top of that, so we have another uh, mount that'll spin in right ascension. So this is the one that will actually follow the night sky. So if I'm looking at the back end of my uh, telescope here, if I take this off, you're gonna see in the back of this one, there's actually um, what they call a polar scope. And that's just another telescope that's, that goes right inside the shaft of this, because depending on where you are um, on the globe, uh, right now I'm at 46 degrees is, 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 the, uh, is the angle to Polaris for me. So when I look at this little scope down here, I have to look through this, find Polaris and get it lined up as close as I can to Polaris as I possibly can if I'm just gonna do some um, observing. Once I've got that done, then when I find a target um, with the telescope as it tracks the night sky using right ascension, because again, the, uh, the earth um, rotates west to east, our conception is that the um, uh, stars are coming, rising in the east and setting in the west. So basically that's what this mount does. It just basically, it, let's say for example that, um, let me just get my, there we are. So there's the telescope. So if I'm starting, let's say I'm looking right at the horizon like this, and then things are coming up. Well, then my scope is gonna basically just follow the sun. Let's just talk about the sun because that's the one everybody's familiar with. And it'll follow the sun right up until it's right straight up in the sky at noon time. And then it starts to basically go the other way. So that's basically what the right ascension does. It follows things from uh, east to west. And then you have also have a declination axis. So if you want to find your target, get it all set up first and get it locked in. Once it's locked in, then that's something you shouldn't have to move again. And basically your right ascension is just essentially going to follow that all the way through. So that's kind of how, um, uh, in a very brief uh, explanation, how an equatorial mount works. As complicated as that seems, once you've done it once or twice and you understand polar alignment, it's very, very simple to do. You can do a polar alignment. Um, when it's dark enough, you can do a polar alignment in probably four or five minutes. Get a good polar alignment. And then once you've got your polar alignment, then um, you have to do what they call another alignment. And, and, and that's when you're using a computer with your telescope. And this, this is um, 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 basically it's a hand, a hand set, which is really a computer. So this actually has 40,000 objects I can go to basically at the press of a button. So if I lock everything in here, just let me just do this for a second. Okay. And if I want to go to the, say the moon, um, I haven't used this in so long. Uh, in my um, planet, there we go. So I just hit planet and then I can choose Mercury moon. And then I just press enter. Oh, it's below the horizon. So I can't do the moon. <laughs> What's up? Anything above it's the sky? It's nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I haven't got this set up anyway. But basically, that's all you do is you basically just press the button, and then it would start to do its little scan. Where's so Venus? <laughs> yeah, okay, let me find Venus here. Planet. Start with a V. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I got this out of whack. These it's DSO guys, eh, Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I don't do any observing, so this is, is obviously showing. But in any event, that's basically what you want to do. There it goes. So I just said Venus, and now the scope is basically it's going to go and find Venus. Right now, I'm in my house, so it really doesn't know where it is. It just thinks it knows where it is based on the coordinates I put in the computer. 
Yeah. Once it finds Venus, it's going to stop and land on Venus and stay there. So I'm just going to set that down for a second. That'll stop in just a few seconds once it decides it thinks it's where it knows where it is. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Stop. Where does it say Venus is? When I says whoa. That means whoa. It's way on the horizon, according to that. Apparently on the horizon. <laughs> you can see how a, how a go to works. You just basically push the put the thing into it in a way. Let me get this camera working. I cannot get anything working right today. There. And it kind of just goes where it wants to if you're going to use a go to mount. So um, they aren't really as difficult as I made them look. They're really quite simple to use well, once you catch on. And the biggest thing with the German equatorial mount. Is first of all, you have to understand that you do need to do a polar alignment on it if you want it to track the sky properly, if you want to use an electronic one. Uh, once you've got the sky tracked on it properly, then basically you just punch in what you want to look at and it'll go there. Unlike the manual one where you kind of you look around and find things. The other side of the coin with this one is, is the mount itself, each one of these mounts um, have a certain payload capacity. And they give you two different numbers. Well, they give you one number, but you got to do a little math and divide it by two. And one would be uh, a payload. In other words, the, the maximum weight you can put on the mount that the mount will comfortably move with the, with the counterweights that are provided with it. And the counterweights are basically those things you see right down there uh, at the very end of that arm. Which am I going? <laughs> I can't do this backwards over here. So that's the <laughs> counterweight right there. And uh, so basically, um, you have to know what the, what the maximum payload is on your mount before you buy your telescope. So if you're going to be using a, a great big, um, you know, eight inch Smith caster grain telescope, and you're going to load it up with two inch eyepieces and a big barlow and a guide scope on top and then heaters and all kinds of other things, you're putting an awful lot of weight on that tube. And chances are it may be more weight than what that mount can handle uh, visually. But if it's not visually, probably more weight than what it can handle for imaging because if the mount like that one says it, it'll handle 30 pounds well then for imaging you're probably looking at maybe 15 pounds is is what you could actually load up on that mount so those are the things that if you're going to buy your mount separate from your ota that you have to understand that okay what what do i want to do with this telescope do i want to image with it or do i want to just uh observe with it if i want to do both um if I'm going to get an imaging, certainly I'm going to need probably a couple of different telescopes, one for planets, one for uh, wide field. So then the one for the planets is going to be the most powerful one, probably the one that's going to be the largest. And because of that, um, you're going to need to know the weight of that tube. If the tube is 12 pounds, and then you, by the time you put your, um, your diagonal on and an eyepiece in there and another camera, you're probably adding another five pounds or more to that. So now you're up to 17 pounds. And then if you decide that you're gonna mount some stuff like I got on this telescope back here, where you can see I've mounted um, uh, a power distribution center and a data center and all that, all that stuff adds weight too. So if that actually is above what they recommend for imaging weight, then you're gonna to need to step up to another mount. So, um, but those are the things to consider um, when you're looking at a mount that you wanna use for both uh, visual and uh, imaging, and uh, certainly if you're going to do both, then you're going to need a, a German equatorial on for that. I want to throw in one, how would you say it, issue with the go-to German equatorial mount or any go-to mount is you have to have a battery. If the batteries right. die, you're done. These go-to mounts may look pretty and they're sharp and they're accurate. They can do all kinds of wonderful things. But they don't come with slow motion controls. So if you lose your battery, you basically lose your mount. You know, you can use clutches and undo them, but you ever try in the dark, loosen off two clutches and move a scope around to find an object in the sky and try to reach over and tighten that uh, clutch again, <laughs> and yeah. it's virtually impossible. So I, I think if you go, you know, if you're a, a manual mount has slow motion control and you can sit and adjust that all night long and you can move from target to target and then, as your target slowly moves, you know, across the eyepiece, you can use the slow motion controls and adjust it back in. If you don't have a battery for your go-to scope, you're pretty much done for the night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I went, my, my first uh, 
big EQ mount was an EQ5, and it actually had tracking motors. And what I could do is it's because of the tracking motors, I could undo the clutches, and I still had slow motion control. It wasn't go-to, but if I got on an object, I could tighten the clutches, and it would track, and that object would stay in the eyepiece if I was polar aligned. And then I could loosen the clutches and still use the slow motion controls to move, you know, move around to another close object rather than having to undo the whole mount and swing it around by hand. Yeah. So, you know, uh, there's something to be said for the original EQ tra uh, the EQ manual mounts with tracking motors over a go-to. Yeah. You know, it still tracks. It still follows night sky. does the same thing. It just doesn't go to the objects by itself. You have to put it on the object. <laughs> yep. But once it's on, it'll track all night long with that object. Absolutely. Yep. So yep. remember, you know, if you're going to get into a go-to scope, uh, you know, you get up to Mount Carlton and you don't have your batteries, you're pretty much done with the weekend, <laughs> right? Yeah, who's going for that? <laughs> but uh, an EQ5 manual mount, you'd have a whole weekend full of wonderful viewing because you still have your slow motion controls and you still have, you know, all that manual stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I so carry both. So when I go to a star party, I got both, just in case. <laughs> I'll go back to a manual mount if I have to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's you know, there's certainly pros and cons in each, each of those designs. Um, so again, it really comes down to what you have, what you're going to do with it. You know, yeah. what you want to do with it. What's your interest? You know, if you think down the road you're going to be doing certain things with it, then consider those things and uh, factor those in when you're going to make that decision. Because uh, lots of times you can go out and buy the, you know, the good and expensive mount if you want to, but um, the end result is by the time you start trading up and getting to where you're eventually going to be, it's usually a lot cheaper to get there first. Um, and I don't mean going to a Paramount or anything like that, but you know, but in these Skywatcher uh, mounts, uh, like uh, you've got an AVX, I think, uh, that uh, Celestron makes. So there's those are like this is an EQ5. And then there's the AVX mount that Celestro makes, and then both of them are somewhere as handy to $1,000, $1,500 for those mounts. Uh, but they're good, uh, solid mounts for the uh, beginner in astrophotography. They're a good, solid mount for uh, anybody getting into observing, and they want to learn and understand how to do a polar alignment and learn, learn those things. Um, it's probably about the best money spent, I think, that's out there on the market. Now, if you're just going to do observing, then I think Mike and Chris, both of you have single fork mounted SE mounts. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if, sure. if all you're going to do is observe, those things are absolutely wonderful. And you can buy the scope and everything in a package, I think, for under $1,000 with the six inch uh, Smith Graf Castle Grain telescope. Yeah. And again, the disadvantage to the SE mount, though, is once your battery goes, you've got no clutches. Yeah. So and replace that with the new Evolution mount. And the Evolution mount has clutches. So even without a battery, you can still enjoy a night, you know, yeah. free handing it. Uh, the yeah. other thing about the SE mount is if you buy a wedge, you can put it into equatorial mode. And then you can go right into only, you know, you can use a guide scope and track just the same as a C-Gem would or, or a yeah. German equatorial would. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, we're talking about these mounts, like everybody knows what they are. <laughs> but I'm going to pull one up, actually, and uh, just show people. The difference between some of these mounts that we're talking about. Um, I'm just going to put my screen unshared if that's okay, guys. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just working on getting a picture of the evolution myself. Okay, good. <laughs> so before we go too deep into it, if you want to find out where um, you can find information on telescopes, um, and where to buy them, who sells them across the country, um, there's a, a site which I have up on the screen I'm showing you now. And it's called Canada Wide Astronomy Buy and Sell. And what this is, this is kind of like the Kijiji of, um, of the astronomy world. So if you're looking for something, you want to get into something, but you're not really sure, um, you know, how deep you want to get into it, you can either go in and buy a new scope, um, whatever your budget allows, or you can go in and buy a used scope for probably half of what you would buy a new scope for. So if you have that same budget, you can get you know, in lots of cases, twice the amount of telescope than what you could if you were to buy it new. And then you could try, so if you said your your budget was five or $600, chances are on here you could find something for five or $600 that would, you know, get you up and going and get you started. But what I want to show you is I'm going to go into, um, 
I think All Star Telescope have a nice lineup of mounts. And so let's say, so we're, right now, this is a company called All Star Telescope, and they're uh, out in uh, Calgary, um, or just outside of Calgary, they're actually in Didsbury, just a short distance from Calgary. And they sell everything. They've been in business a long time. Uh, Ken out there is a fantastic guy. He does a lot of work with Alan Dyer, which is uh, one of the um, uh, Canada's uh, favorite astrophotographers. And so, and, and so he sells all this stuff. So if you go down the side, you see that there's products you can look at. So if we go to um, mounts and tripods, so then what will come up is a whole selection of different types of things you can get. So if you want to go to Skywatcher mounts, like we were talking about earlier, or Celestron mounts. So let's go to Celestron mounts. And I'll bring up um, that AVX. There should be one here somewhere. Yeah, just above it, Paul. Oh, you did I miss it? it? Yeah. Just a little higher. A little higher. Uh, there you go. Advanced to AVX. Oh, sorry. Advanced VX EQ. Advanced yeah. VX. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So there's an advanced VX. So there it is, $1,240. And so there's basically, I'll just see if I can blow that up so you can see the picture of it. So this is a German equatorial mount, very similar to what I've got behind me here in the Skywatcher. And uh, basically it's a go-to, so it's got the hand pad on it so that you can, you know, select things in the sky. Um, I'm not sure if this one, Mike, you can tell me, when you buy that new, does it have a polar scope? Because I know Celestron is famous for making you buy the polar scope separate. Honestly, I think you do have to buy the polar scope separate. Okay, yeah, because the Skywatcher ones are built in. Right. And, uh, and I think also the, if you went to um, uh, the uh, uh, Ioptron, theirs are built in too. I think Emil has a CEM60, and I think his came with the Polar Scope. I have the version before the VX. It's called the uh, ASGT, and it had to have a Polar Scope purchased separately. Yeah, yeah, and on my CGM was the same. I had to have a separate Polar Scope built up, put on it. But in any event, what the polar scope is, is just a little scope that slips into this part of the tube. And uh, and there's a little cap on the front right there. You just remove that cap, and then you can look right through up to the sky, find an, a line of Polaris with that. That's what you do. Uh, the counterweight's on the bottom because your payload's going to be on the top. So that's just like um, just like a big uh, teeter-totter. Make sure that the weight's the same weight as what your telescope is on the other side, and it'll balance off nice. So anything that you need to know about... Um, that mount is all in there. And they'll talk about all, all of the different accessories and so on and so forth. But it goes to, we were talking about payload capacity. And this one here, so payload capacity on this one is 30 pounds. So 30 pounds um, would be for observing. So if you want to put, you know, I would say maybe, and I'd be pushing it. Uh, no, I, I guess it comfortably, you could put an eight inch uh, SDT on that. Yeah. It should work quite well visually. Yeah. And load it up with all the goodies. Um, if I was going to do imaging with it, I'd probably go to a refractor or maybe a six inch SCT, something a fair bit lighter. And also, um, uh, uh, the, the focal length of your telescope will play a big havoc or a big part rather in, uh, in how well that mount tracks the sky for you too. So if you're using a, a refractor like we showed you earlier, because there's such a short focal length, you know, because it's such a wide field of view, there's a lot of forgiveness in how the mount tracks. But you start pushing up there with 2,000 plus millimeters of focal length, then you want to make sure that your, you know, your mount is really um, polar aligned well, that kind of stuff. So there's things like that that you have to consider, that's all. So that would be basically um, the, uh, the Celestron VX VX mount in a go-to style right there. So anyway, that's one of the one of the sites. There's all kinds of sites that are on there. Any one of those things up there will get you to any one of the Canadian um, uh, retailers for telescopes, uh, and they're all across the country. So I can quickly show this uh, Evolution Altaz mount. Just a second, okay. Michael. Uh, uh, hang on, Michael. Click on you here. Get you up on the screen. You should show the Evolution on the screen there. This is a full package. It's the mount, the eight-inch optical tube. Uh, it, it is fancy. It's got built-in Wi-Fi. Uh, it is a single arm alt as. And if you look on, on the top side here, the orange circle, and the orange circle here on the eight inch SE used from someone for in around twelve, twelve hundred and fifty yeah. bucks. Or you can buy
questions around it for sure. Hey guys. Any questions out there, Chris? Sorry about that. We just uh, we're off call there for a second. We're back. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah. no, we lost we lost the YouTube feed for a second, so I had to bring it back. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, don't see any questions on the YouTube stream. Looking for some on on Facebook. Just a second here. Uh, no questions, just uh, comments, I guess. Uh, this would be more of an accessory, but would you recommend an EQ platform for Adobe users? No, I was a little tracking uh, plates that go on the, on the bottom of your DAW. Uh, if you want to keep it in the center of the eyepiece for about an hour, that might, you know, it's an expensive way to keep it, uh, the object in the center for your eyepiece, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, yes, lots of people have them. They're out there. Uh, and there's some, you know, you can build your own actually relatively cheap. Uh, but to me, I, I would, uh, I, I personally don't see a great use for them. Yeah, there's, uh, there are like the go-to uh, style, right? Dobbs as well. Is that what he's talking about? Or are they uh, talking no, about that? No, I think we just talking about the platform. Yeah, just yeah the, the platform, platform sits on motorized to get about an hour out of it or, right. or more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you can get go to Dobsonians as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great for sketching. Yeah. That's, that's true, too. But it's keeping it in the center of the eyepiece longer. That's pretty much all it's doing for you. Right. That was a yeah. comment from Emil. They are great for sketching. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay. I guess we're done with comments. I guess we're into uh, we're over an hour now, guys. <laughs> yeah, we were going to do Roseanne. Time. Yeah, we got time for that now. Still. I think so. Uh, we're ten after nine. So. Uh, there's, a, there's a good question from Jack here. Uh, okay. Chris says, sure. I have a Celestron 130 Astromaster, and I'm frustrated with the EQ mount. I can understand that. Can I retrofit it uh, for an Altez? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you already have a set of rings on it. All you have to do is buy a dovetail plate. And, uh, you know, the Twilight mounts are fantastic for a, a, a scope about the size of your 130. Uh, it's a lot more solid than probably the EQ1 that came with it. And uh, definitely you'd uh, have much, much less frustration. Can you bring that yeah. one back over again for a sec, Mike, to show that? Yeah, sure Twilight can. Yeah. Yeah, and two while he's bringing that over, um, because he's using that, was that a was that a, maybe somebody could check? I don't have the comments here. Was that um, a reflector? Yeah, 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 it was. So the reflector is quite long. So uh, because of that, uh, Mount Mike's going to show um, that same feature that we talked about earlier about being able to tilt that arm back forty five degrees will allow you to swing that. Um, that's a lot better. Yeah, it was a Celestron 130 Astromaster, so yeah. Okay. Uh, well, focus, can you see that there? Yep. Just a sec, uh, get on to you, Mike. Hang on a second. Click on you here, both links. There we go. Do we get my camera to focus here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're good. So your 130 Astromaster is not much bigger than this uh, Skywatcher. Right back, guys. <laughs> This is one step down. This is a 114. But uh, like I said, your Astro Master 130 is not a whole lot bigger. And you can snap that right on there. And you've got uh, nice slow motion controls, good steady movement. And uh, even in the wind, this mount is as solid as a rock. So I would say, yeah, your C1 or your, your uh, last round 130 would mount on one of these Twilights real easy. You only have to fix it up there. Okay. If that helps. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Twilight 2 with basically the same the same scope. This is a 114, but uh, there's a what four or uh, four inch as opposed to your five inch on the 130. And I put this scope on this, this mount all the time. And Emil says, uh, when using an alt as, if things are too close to the zenith, you simply observe other things and wait an hour. Wait an hour, yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly it. Like I said, this, uh, this part will swing down, and yeah, it may hit, but uh, with this mount, you can uh, basically loosen off the bolts down here and tip this back 45 degrees, and that's what it's for. So you'll get zenith, and the, two, and the optical tube won't hit the mount. Hmm. 
Excellent. I just have it set up for a small refractor right now, and I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Excellent. But yeah, so, that's a good question. What do they run, Mike? About uh, three hundred bucks or so? What I they think they're, they're probably under three hundred shipped to your door. Okay. Uh, if you look around, I forget where we were getting the ones for the club, but uh, it cost me under three hundred to have it shipped to my house. Nice. Okay. So. Yeah, so, and they're solid too. What's can you can you lift it up, Mike, and show the the base? Yeah. So, yeah. That, so that's a one and a half inch uh, uh, steel tube. One and a quarter inch legs, I think. And then uh, you know you got this the center uh, the spreader. Spreader, and then that tightens up and holds the legs out tight. Yeah. And then. Uh, if you can look at the bottom, I don't know if I can show it here, but the legs will expand out, so this stands up pretty high. Yeah. And uh, it's still good and solid. I I swear by these mounts for, for people like the beginner. We got one for Meg. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple for the club, or at yeah. least one for the club for the solar scope. And uh, it's the best bang for the buck that I found for uh, a, a beginner alt as mount that's got some actual beef to it. Yeah, it's really rugged. Yeah. And that's the thing to keep, like we talked about earlier, is that, uh, you know, the rickety style mounts are going to frustrate you because you're looking at something through telescope that's magnified. And the more you magnify, the, the shake of your image is going to get as well, right? So I think it was, uh, I, had, I think it was a, an Astrotech Altaz mount. And uh, I paid almost $500 for it. And these, <laughs> this mount is actually better. <laughs> yep. The Astrotech, the legs had an issue. Uh, with this one, it, 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 they're just a good all-around, uh, you know, alt as mount for smaller scopes. Anything up to say uh, six inch, hmm. six inch reflector, six inch spit cast grain, or you know, any reflector that's a short tube or refractor that's a short tube. Sorry, uh, it's a good all-around beginner's mount. And you're back to a grab and go style as well because you, you know you can take yeah. that without taking a battery pack with you and. Absolutely. It has, you know, clutches and slow motion controls and everything you need. <laughs> so lots of good nights at the beach with this puppy. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hopefully more of them <clears throat> soon. I know that um, uh, Matt uses, uh, he's got an ETX and uh, he retrofitted it so he can put it on a mount and that's what he uses, I think. Yeah, this is what he uses. Yeah. 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 It works absolutely wonderful. It's, uh, it's a great it's, uh, beefy mount. We looked at other ones in the $250 range uh, by Celestron and Orion, and I'm sorry, but they were as cheap as EQ1. Uh, these Explore Scientifics are the best bang for the buck for a small alt as solid mount that you get a lot of use out of. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, they're well built, they're quality built for a, a really good price. Mm hmm. Okay, so we've covered mounts, I guess, guys, pretty well uh, tonight. Um, we're going to carry on with maybe uh, Rosanna's fun facts at the moment. No, unless there are any other questions, I'm going to wait here for maybe 30 seconds just to be sure if there's any other questions that come up about mounts. Of course, we're going to do a review again uh, next week. We'll talk a little bit about what we've covered so far, and then we're going to carry on to, into accessories, which is going to be um, another whole ball of wax all together because we've got a lot of accessories to talk about. So any other questions about mounts before we move on? Just watching the Facebook stream here. Found it on Explorer Scientific and it's on sale too. Excellent, Jack. Oh, right. So uh, we, get oh, right. we get a finder's fee for that so you can buy one for each of us as well. <laughs> yeah. If they're 75% off, we'll take four of them. That's right. It's like Emil says, heaviness is a good thing. I've always preached, you know, your mount can never be too big. That's It'd right. be a little ridiculous to have like an EQ8 mount with an 80 millimeter Orion Acro on it. Yes. But I tell you one thing, it would be accurate and it would never shake in a hurricane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. So let's carry on with uh, our next little segment, I guess. Uh, Paul, I guess that's up to you now. Oh, okay. uh, second here, I try to get things unlocked, and I might even be ready to go. Let's see if we can find right. us. Uh, hmm. Shall we give it a try? We will. Time for it. Mm -hmm. 
Rosanna's Fun Fact. There. The it worked. Time. It worked. Worked. I'm so happy. <laughs> all right well all right so this week uh we we, we didn't have Rosanna on last week because we just ran out because we get yakking the, the way that we do and uh so this week uh we're gonna talk a little bit about comments and things like that so so Rosanna says uh comments are notoriously fickle uh, breaking promises and more than just a few astronomers have had their hopes dashed when predicted brightening turns into a fizzled dud <laughs> instead of like Comet Atlas did earlier this year. But Comet Swan does seem to be making good on its promise of becoming a naked eye object by mid-May. Now, the projected date is May the 13th when it's expected to make its closest pass to Earth. Uh, and here's is a gorgeous picture from Australia. Now, she said put a picture on it. But I want to put something else on it uh, prior to that. So Comet Swan, Comet Swan even has its own Twitter feed. And I'm going to show you that. And it is, ooh, if I can find it. There it is. So, so, so this is Comet Swan. And somehow Comet Swan came down and got into our internet and put itself on there. It says, hi, I'm the brightest comet in the sky. I am already visible to the naked eye. Follow me for updates on my distance and my position. So you can go on to this uh, site. You can see the, the thing up here, the, uh, the, the, the page. And uh, basically every day there's a little tweet. And it, as it goes on, it uh, just gives you a little different information. Down here it says, dear earthlings, every week I choose three stars among my followers. Today's winners are, and then there's people that you can kind of um, interact with this little uh, tweeter thing. Our Twitter thing, and uh, basically there's a picture of one right there. Now, Comet Swan is invisible to us right now. It's in the constellation Triangulum, but happens to be right now Triangulum is very close and it sets up close to where the sun does uh, at this stage in time. So it's going to be a while before we get to see it. But um, so that's the little um, Twitter page on Comet Swan. Now Rosanna goes on to talk us talk talk to us about um, uh, if you're not a Twitter fan website. Sponsor that Twitter feed is. Okay, now there's another website that she gives us which tells you exactly where the swan is and answers almost every possible question you can have. And that would be this one here. And this is called the Sky Live. And so this is your guide to solar system in the night sky. And right now there's a section right in there all about Comet Swan, where its uh, coordinates are, the constellation that it's in, the observable magnitude, and the visibility right now. And it tells you all kinds of different things about it. So you can go to either of those um, uh, sites and uh, keep your eye uh, on the comet, as it were. And uh, so if you missed the Lyrids in April and perhaps the almost full moon, the last of supermoons in 2020 uh, uh, washed out, of course, the Eta Equids earlier this week, uh, this week on May the 5th and 6th. So she wrote this uh, last week. Cross your fingers and start tracking Comet Swan because it looks promising. And that is this week's. Uh, da, 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 da. Hang on. I think we got it. I think we got it. Oh, oh, oh. Hang on. There it is. Cue the words. Rosanna's fun fact. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosanna. Oh, the stress. The stress you guys put me under. <laughs> <laughs> oh excellent okay um so let's thanks paul appreciate that and rosanna thank you very much for those uh facts on comet swan we're hoping to go to, we're going to get a chance to see it uh, soon in our sky actually it, it is up in uh, it's going to be in perseus i think very shortly so it will be up in our evening sky uh but and then early morning um of course before the sun comes up so it's uh it hasn't been promising right yet, but we're still hoping that once it rounds the sun, we might get a chance to, to see it flare up. So let's see what happens. Anyway, um, I did want to take a second and uh, if I can, second here, I gotta get some stuff out of my way. Uh, I think I can do it this way. Oh, sec. Oh, I ain't gonna work that way either. No, there we go. Oh, come on. <laughs> Come on. 
He's stubborn. He's stubborn. He's stubborn. He's stubborn. He's stubborn. I don't want to close my window. No, nope, I'm not going to get them up. Hang on a second. <laughs> oh. Oh, I hate the wind does this on me. No. Well, okay, anyway, we might have to bring them up next week. <laughs> <clears throat> Photos were going to be brought up next, but they're on the wrong screen here, and I can't seem to get uh, get them off the uh, on the right screen without uh, closing the window. So I don't want to do that. Doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do it. Oh, well, maybe I will. Hang on. Oh, hey, just a second. Maybe I can. Okay, let me try to share my screen here. I just had a few photos that I wanted to uh, show. Go back to the screen, I guess. Screen one. Share. Nope. I'm going to go screen two. Unshare. Stop screen share. Let's try again. Share screen two. Let's see if that comes up. Okay, is that going to feed out on two? Yes, feeding out on both channels, it looks like. Okay, so I had a few photos here. Um, one here from Irene Doyle from her balcony. I'm going to have to bring it over this way, I guess. Shot of the moon from her balcony. Oh, look at that. Yeah, nice. nice so, uh, so is, is Irene online right now? I think she's online. She might be. Uh, is that co coming up or is that going down? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't ask her, but she did have a nice shot of the, uh, moon here too. Super moon. Just a sec. Uh, bring that one over. Here we go. I'm not very good at this, but, uh, there. Well, that's a big moon. That's nice a, wow. I said, wow. Did you take that picture? She, yep. She did. And, uh, she captured it very well. And the sun still lights up the electrical poles. Look, like they're orange. Yeah. That's cool. It is cool. Very nice. Um, okay, so let me uh, make sure that I'm clicked on over this one. And, uh, oh, you know me. Let me try again. Okay. Let's try uh, this one here from Peter. Sent in Peter Visma. And hopefully I can get that to run. Oh, it's a movie. Yeah, it's a movie, yeah. So we'll see if it's going to work. Ah. And there, there. there. Okay, oh, yeah, a sec. So it's the rising oh. moon, but we don't have sound because we can't get sound on Google Hangouts. We saw that before, right? So let's go back to the beginning here. And that's the uh, super moon rising. Oh, wow. It nice. is the uh, sound of peepers in the background. Yeah. Oh, that's that's out my window. <laughs> yeah. It works. <laughs> nice clear shot, though. Wow. See, yeah, that's, yeah. that's coming nice from job. my window. Nice job of dubbing, Chris. Thanks. When did, you get, when did you get a night like that one? Because I couldn't see it that crisp. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's amazing. Yeah, it is. Beautiful. Unreal. Yeah. Wow. Very, Very well nice. done. Yeah. That must have been Very between crisp. snowstorms that we had. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you so can, that's... You can really see the, the Mario there, eh? Oh, and, um, unreal. Yeah, and the uh, the detail here around the even around the edge, right? Oh, that's beautiful. Very nice crisp. Job. Very well done, Peter. Yes. Uh, Tim says, I think I saw Comet Panstars last night around midnight between Polaris and the uh, POI terminal stars of the Big Dipper. Looks somewhat oh, really? like a globular cluster. Yeah. Uh, Irene Doyle says, yes, that she's on here. Thanks, Dave. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. So thanks, Peter. Yeah. And I'm going to drop that one out of the way. And uh, I just want to make a comment quickly about uh, this, the Starlink mission. Um that we're all big fans of. We all love Starlink. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me get this to full screen. Yeah, so Starlink is, um, of course, the satellites that have, uh, there are 420 of them up there right now. There was supposed to be Starlink 7 launch this week. I guess it's really 8, but uh, Starlink 0 was the first one. So they've got 420 satellites up now. This was going to be another 60 going up. Out of 12,000 that will be up over the next few years um, and the launch was supposed to take place uh, this morning 
and it was uh, scrubbed uh, because of uh, Atlas flight had to be uh, launched first, I guess, and then uh, it was due to bad weather. And then uh, they had looked at it for tomorrow, and it's been scrubbed for tomorrow again. So um, it's looking at uh, the 19th, I guess, uh, no, before it was going to go. Mistaken, Chris. Aren't these ones, some of these ones, supposed to have that new coating they're going to try to see if it's non reflective? Well, they have a, what they call visor sat. So yeah. it's going to be a flip up uh, visor, basically. It's a transparent piece of foam that will allow sunlight to penetrate it and, and uh, recharge the solar panels, but it won't uh, allow sunlight to reflect back through it again. So. Okay. Um, we don't know how many of them are going to, they didn't really say how many are going to be uh, lit up like that or how many are going to be equipped with the visor sat. Right. But there's two things that they're planning on doing. Uh, one of them is to equip them with these visor sat. Uh, it's almost like a sun shield that would fit in your windshield of your car. And uh, the second thing is that they're going to rotate them a bit so that when they do come up over the horizon, they're, they're going to, uh, their, their panels aren't going to be facing uh, back to us. So there's two tech, two things that they're going to try to uh, incorporate over the next little while. But with this particular mission here, I, I don't think they got all the visor sats. It's just more or less a sample. And then I think with uh, Starlink mission number eight, which is really number nine, the next one after this, they'll they'll all be equipped with visor sats. And uh, is, that, is that after they had a look at them to make sure they are going to work? These are yeah, these are, yeah, yeah, that's these what are it is. trial. Yeah, these are trial. These okay. ones. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the so the launch is, was scrubbed today. It's going to scrub tomorrow. It goes on um, Tuesday, I guess. Well, it's going to be clean if it gets scrubbed twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, it goes on the 19th. And uh, so I think the first time we get a chance to see it would be the 20th. Um, and you can go to Heavens Above uh, website to look it up. You can look at Starlink 7. Uh, the launch time is actually 4 in the morning. So it's not going to be a nice uh, evening pass like we saw um, on the last one. So you're going to have to get up nice and early to pick, pick up this one. Uh, but of course, if you get up that early, you're going to get to see uh, the few planets in the morning sky too. So that's always worthwhile. Uh, but we're going to catch them around 4.30 in the morning uh, on the 20th. They'll be about a magnitude 3.8, which is not very bright. That's about the same as brightness maybe of Polaris, maybe a little bit dimmer than Polaris. But the following morning, they're going to be about 1.6. Uh, and in between each level of magnitude is about two and a half times exponentially brighter. So uh, we're going to see them about five times brighter on the pre on the on the following day. So if yeah. I was going to pick one of the two days, and I was really a big fan of Starlink, then I would want to probably pick the Wednesday, like um, the day after the the launch, uh, to to get to see them. So uh, that's going to be again 4:30 or so in the morning. So if you're up nice and early, uh, you go to Heavens Above website. Uh, scroll down to Starlink 7 on the drop-down menu, and then on the right of that, you'll see a window saying uh, from May 18th at 00 until May 19th at 00. Just scroll over a couple of days, and then you'll see them start to populate underneath a, on the table. Once they go up, uh, they've, what they've done is they've put a placeholder there now, just uh, saying that that's what's going to happen if the, if the launch does go ahead. Of course, the launch doesn't go ahead. They just move that placeholder ahead some. But uh, once the launch does happen, you'll start to see them populate in large numbers. 60 of them will populate there on that one table. So you can go to that, or you can go to, uh, there's another website that Mike had released there earlier about Starlink. Hey, Mike? Uh, Find yeah. Starlink, I think it's called. And it'll tell you, it'll it'll place you on the planet and show you what it's going to look like as they fly over your head. The only thing about that site I found is that it didn't give the magnitude or the brightness of them. So it was a little tougher to find. But anyway, that's that's what's coming up. So uh, everybody who loves to, to watch uh, Starlink satellites going by, um, we're going to get to see what's going to happen uh, for astronomers, I guess, in, in all that package eventually. So, so let me add, it is well worth getting up at 4.30 in the morning. I was on the back deck this morning having my coffee before I went to work. Yep. And I saw four meteors go by. One was a very long tail, went up just after them. And we got that for a couple, a couple more days, maybe. The moon, I think it's up. I think we're yeah. getting very close to news. So I think we got a couple more days. Uh, but yeah, beautiful views of, of Jupiter and Saturn if you're out in the early morning sky right now. And Mars is out there too right now. And uh, Mars is going to continue to get a little bit brighter in our sky. It's going to switch over to our evening sky here shortly uh, as we catch up to it because we're coming up to opposition with Mars here shortly as well. So uh, we'll here, have... here this morning it was plus seven and zero wind. It was just incredible. 
Um, and why did you go to work? <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy makes me. <laughs> Well, folks, I guess that's it for tonight. Uh, we're into uh, an hour and 33 minutes. Wow. Does time ever go, go by fast when you're having a few laughs? So uh, I think what we're going to do is, is call that a night uh, for tonight as far as mounts go. Remember, next week now we're going to talk all, all about accessories. So uh, next week we'll be talking about eyepieces, uh, diagonals, dew shields, battery packs, all these things that will make your evening a little bit more uh, <laughs> right up Mike's alley. <laughs> All these things that will make your uh, your uh, evening of observing uh, a lot more pleasant. Uh, so in closing tonight, I'd like to thank uh, each and every one of you again for your continued support of our efforts here. Uh, I wanted to remind you again that we do love getting your photos. And please uh, send them in to Sunday Night Astronomy Show, all one word, at gmail.com. And we will collect them for our next show after the workshops. Before I sign off, I have to say uh, hello to my brother Danny, who, oh, yeah. tunes, Hi, Dan. in, who, Dan. who tunes in to us every week. Uh, he said he missed last week and was really upset about it, but we appreciate him coming by every week. So thanks, Dan. And my special thanks again, of course, to Rosanna Armstrong for her fun facts episode. And of course, uh, Mike and Paul here for their continued contributions to the show. I would also uh, ask that if you enjoyed the content here tonight, please consider giving us a like on the episode and please consider subscribing if you haven't already done so on YouTube. i also like to ask that you share with your friends and family that we are live every Sunday night. And uh, finally, we'd like to wish all of you a good health and safe week. Congratulations to all of you here in New Brunswick for f continuing to flatten the curve. We're doing very well here in the province. We had 120 cases. All cases have recovered. So we just have to keep our guard up for a little bit longer now. And although the majority of our star parties have been now been canceled for our, this year, we are still looking forward to sharing the views with you again from our favorite local spot, Saints Rest Beach, uh, just outside the confines of the Irving Nature Park. And I'm very glad that we do have this program even uh, to uh, offer you uh, to keep us in touch. So remember, folks, uh, keep washing those hands. Practice your social distancing for a little while longer. Stay at home if you can. And know that we are here to help entertain you each week at the same time. So from now then, from Mike, Paul, and I, stay safe, everyone. We hope to see you back here again next week. And as we like to say, keep your scopes pointed up. Thanks so much, folks. Have a great evening and have a great week. Good night. <laughs>